The thing I would expect from Harry always is the unexpected. Never knew what was going to show up. Mortality and life are the things that keep me, keep me uh, focused. I'm, I'm very upset by it. And I'm, I'm, I'm very angry about it. I'm very angry about it. I'm pretty happy about life. That, that's the most beautiful thing, uh, the, the gift beyond anything. But um, the other part, the, 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 end of the, the end of the movie, you, know, you have to leave the cinema and you see, you see, you see, you know, where you're going to go. <laughs> that's the bummer. And I think every day I take a picture. I'm, I'm thinking about it all the time. I have way awake wake up, I'm thinking about it. When I go to sleep, I think about it. It's really scary. It's my life. He was, uh, to the end, a perfectionist in everything he did. They are the best of that kind of work that has um, a darkness to it, that absolute dark beauty. And Nicky used to say to him, why don't you photograph apples and oranges? The trouble with you, Harry, you'll be famous when you're dead. That's what I've always felt about his art, that it's, a, it's like a, an attempt to get close to death. It's a particular kind of aesthetic that I think is... Um, uh, absolutely fascinating. No matter how many negatives or um, how many notes indeed he's made from during the time he's actually doing his printing, no one will be able to make another Harry Tullier picture. What I wanted everybody to know was that Harry did not do it to himself, that he did not intend that to happen, that it was somebody did something malicious to him that caused it. It wasn't self-inflicted. Harry Tullia Jr. died in Milan on the 27th of December 1997. His death took place in circumstances which have been described as an accident, misadventure and as manslaughter. Up until that moment his life had been spent following his own distinct vision through fine art photography. He was obsessed with the cruelty of death and the beauty of life which instilled his photographs with a profound sensual darkness. A highly sensitive man, he dealt with life's ups and downs by sometimes trying to escape or mask the pain he felt. At other times, he stood up and faced the world with extraordinary courage. At the time of his death, his work had finally begun to achieve the recognition he had fought so hard for. He never lived to see his reputation grow into that of one of Ireland's leading exponents of fine art photography. Do you have any formal training? Nope. <laughs> It'll be over in five minutes, guaranteed. <laughs> uh, yeah, I went to school in Memphis. I stayed in Memphis for two years. Mm -hmm. And um, I had the most amazing teacher in the world, Murray Reese, and he showed me the, the ropes. And unfortunately, I had to leave, and I went to, to Boston for two years. I got my degree there for what it was worth. And um, I, think, I think my best two years were in Memphis. What I thought about Harry, and that was what I thought about his photography, was that he wanted to understand life. And at first I used to think, well, maybe it's because he comes from another culture, but it, it wasn't. That was just Harry. It was, um, uh, he had his way of, um, he, truly, he truly focused in on, on, uh, on photography. When he started seeing Jennifer, all of his photography changed. Jen is a channel for me. She represents woman. And though the images of woman are not positive at all times, they do not represent a cynicism or dislike of woman or womanhood. Up until that point, it was just development. He was just developing where he was going. And when Jennifer came onto the scene, suddenly these incredible photographs started turning up. You know, that's what makes photographs so interesting, or any art. You bring all that up and you bring it out of your psyche, you bring it out of your wherever it sits internally inside you and um, and you and you make it visible woman is the bearer of fruit the bearer of man men have existence because of the female woman mother 
I hope that I can clarify this. I remember when that first happened, he would dream about her at night, and he just sort of became obsessed. But instead of um, putting his obsession all on her, on the woman, like a lot of us do, we put the obsession on our love, he was able to put that obsession into his work and mix the two. This is my first effort at breaking through with word to my photos. I felt angry that some people put the slant on my work, that I have a dislike and a cruelty towards women. Untrue. I would ask a seizures at time because how do you react or how do you interact or how do you even um, handle yourself when you have someone that you know is great? I mean, Harry was true greatness. I mean, you could see the genius in him. And he would influence other students around him to be courageous that way. He became good friends with uh, a Korean boy named Jing Hong. And one day, Harry would bring in a picture and we would all go, oh, golly, is this terrific. It would take our breath away. And, and the next week, Jin Hong would bring in a photograph and Harry would say, oh, gee, this is so terrific. And they would just keep upping one another. And, and they both grew from that friendly competition. And, 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 and the, the rest of the class would look on and they were forced to grow too because they, they saw it was okay to be bold and interesting and, and self-revealing. And it was an interesting class. And, and Harry, Harry was the core of it. Harry woke everybody up. Tulia left Memphis in 1986, having completed his BA in photography. He now wanted to specialize in the areas of photography that suited his particular vision. He applied successfully to the Massachusetts College of Art in Boston, where he would study for his BA in fine art photography. The thing about the pictures, the root is there all the time, and I can't help it. And even when the pictures are happy, or when the pictures are sad, or when the pictures are, are sleeping, the, that, that thing, that undercurrent is there all the time, and I, I can't get away from it. <laughs> His uh, art uh, uh, represents an extraordinary, extraordinary kind of perception, I think, which, which makes his, his, uh, his work uh, extremely interesting. It's like a, an attempt to get close to death. It's a particular kind of aesthetic that I think is um, uh, absolutely fascinating. And that I think is, is something that, uh, that uh, one does encounter in, in, in people who use drugs and it's sometimes referred to um, uh, as a kind of a junky aesthetic. And it's certainly not to, be, um, not to be considered in a kind of derogatory way. When I first met him, he really wasn't doing the drug thing. But he was battling... I hate the term battling demons, but he, but he, in essence, he was. I get terrible pictures in my head at night before I fall asleep. I have to shake myself, say something, stop the pictures. I think it's, it, it is, it, an element of it is, is an attempt to master death uh, through getting close with and to try to represent it, so to master the ultimate master. Uh, and that's an impossibility. It can have disastrous consequences, especially if it gets connected up with drugs, which it does in, in that, that drug aesthetic or, or junkie aesthetic. He was doing pretty much whatever he could get his hands on at that point in time. Not so much the stuff that made you, you know, speed along. It was the things that were going to bring him down. So he wanted to be, he, that's how he wanted to feel. He wanted to be somewhere else. It was good to go to New York and see Jin Hung. I was getting lonely in Boston, not being able to relate to anyone. But Boston was, I don't know if it was too much, too exciting, too many opportunities, too many different people, too many different cultures, too many different ways of accessing the things that he wanted. New England is a tough place to live. Um, it's uh, difficult in, in so many ways, and Memphis isn't like that. Memphis is this wonderful cocoon, and I think being out of the cocoon for Harry um, was maybe just too much for him. It might have been too overwhelming for him. And this was perhaps his way of, of gaining some control with the drugs, with the drinking. Upon finishing his fine arts degree, Tulia returned to Ireland. However, the lifestyle that he had led in Boston was to have its consequences. And I remember Harry telling me that he'd been hospitalized and that he had cut his wrist, or slit his wrist. 
and he basically just said that he had had a nervous breakdown, that he had lost it. In February of 1990, Thulia was admitted into the care of St. John of God's, a psychiatric hospital in Dublin. For 18 days, he received rehabilitation and therapy that helped him regain his sense of equilibrium. It made him realize that he had to reevaluate his life and his way of living. You have to say, an artist's life, it can't be even. And the balances have to come and go. It's like a tide of your emotions or your feelings. They come in and out. Sometimes you're better than others, or sometimes you're able to say things or do things better than others. And maybe for Harry, there was a couple of tides that came in too far and went out too far. I don't know. How many truly happy, extremely happy people do you see creating art? <laughs> I think there has to be some sadness in your life or some uh, drama. I think he knew at that point that his life was changing, that, that he was changing, that he perhaps was on this downward spiral. I think he, he knew that his actions were causing him to be um, put into, uh, there were, that he was putting himself into very unsafe situations, whether it was because of his anger or his drinking or uh, his interactions with other people. And perhaps other people weren't respecting who he was and um, his importance as an artist. He, if he was troubled, uh, I, I, he didn't show it. But uh, I think deep down uh, he had that touch of insecurity. Read some books in photography, then I felt even more down, because I'm not sure if I have the capabilities to be successful. Well, I think there was a lo big lack of confidence. I think he knew his work was good, and he believed in himself as a photographer, but not commercially, not to put it out there. There is an element of fighting your work up there, you know. There is an element of that now, you know, then and now. Frustration probably drove him on, kept him going. How do you find life as an artist in Ireland? Well, it's, it's lousy, it's lousy. Um, I've applied for a particular grant for the past two years. Mm -hmm. This is the year of my third. I've been turned down the last two, two times. And I, I really depended on those. If I had got them, it would have kept me going for at least half a year with my materials, with, with stuff. And I could have applied myself better instead of having to go out and looking for selling myself short, um, cheap, um, doing commercial stuff. Do you do commercial work? I do commercial work, yeah. <laughs> but I don't like it. I hate it. It's hard to be an artist any, anywhere, any time. Um, I don't think any one time is any particularly harder than another time. And um, it is hard going. It was hard going for Harry, of course it was. Whether the world recognizes him has to do whether the world is ready to listen to someone's voice. Maybe not so much recognition but I think just being able to do what he'd love to do and still pay the bills. But he would never sacrifice it. Uh, um, you know, it was to be pure art or nothing. There was no compromise with Harry. Am I right? Quite right, yeah. In order to supplement his own artistic vision, he had spent more time doing commercial work, which he hated. And in the early 90s, his work was definitely ahead of his time. However, he refused to compromise and it was this that gained him a reputation for originality and style, especially in the music business. I kind of knew from Harry's work that um, I wanted to do something with him that would make sense of the work. And the obvious outlet for me was something in the music industry. Um, and I thought kind of quite long and hard about where to place what he was doing. And then we came up, um, this new band came to me called Emotional Fish. And I had uh, picked out one of Harry's shots, uh, which I intended to use 
as the album cover it was something that I thought was a very strong, very vital, um, really interesting uh, shot. It was such a great image, and it really sort of suited us as such. You know, with the music we were making, it really I felt it just married it so much together. This record company had been whining and dying us for like uh, months, you know, and brought us to all the best restaurants and told us how to use a knife and fork and stuff, you know. <laughs> and then, you know, it was great, and we brought in our album cover, convinced this was it, and, and, and a guy looked at it and said, what's that? That's shit. So that was a kind of devastating blow at that stage. Now, uh, being a first-time band, um, Emotional Fish probably didn't have uh, the push that they would need to say no, no, we want to, we, we're going to stick with this. We want, we want to use it. So there was a sort of an about face change. But you know, we got Harry on uh, on the inner sleeve, and he, even that, I think, if, if it, had that been our album cover, uh, there'd been a little bit more pride in me or something, you know. And I think now, like m making music and, and walking, I think I would take more of a leaf from Harry's book and, and not compromise, you know. The commercial work that he completed at this time was destined to have a life beyond its initial use. Years later, his photographs are still being used in books, magazine articles and record covers. In December of 1990, Thulia was photographing a crowd of street punks. He had, up to this point, exposed himself to potentially volatile situations without any harm coming to him. However, the events that subsequently took place that night would have a far-reaching effect on both his personal and professional lives. That evening we had a couple of drinks in um, Henry's bar and then around 12 o'clock we went around the corner. He had basically been involved in an incident. Harry approached them, you know, how are you, blah, 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 and uh, started taking a few shots. The only analogy I could take to you is if you took a very nice, firm plum. As Harry was taking more pictures, and these people were falling more and more all over each other. And you just smashed into it with a broken bottle, then you got a very squashed plum on your hands. Uh, this guy just stood up out of the blue and picked up a, gra a glass from Grafton Street, from the road, and he just picked it up and smashed it on the ground and went for a hurry. In Dublin's Eye and Ear Hospital, the doctors were appalled at the extent and savagery of his injury. The eye had been split through a 90 degree angle. In addition, serious internal hemorrhaging made for a bleak prognosis for saving his vision. He underwent two and a half hours of surgery. I can't imagine what went through his mind because Harry lived for his work and he lived for his photography. Well, he tried to make very light of it as though it didn't really matter. But if you're a photographer and you lose, I think it was 70 or 80 percent of his vision in one eye, it can't have been there. It was bound to shake his confidence. It would only be like a painter losing one of his arms or something like that. I think it had a, a, a dramatic effect on him. In fact, I don't believe he was ever the same after that. I avoid my gaze these days especially. I have some sort of hang-up over my peeper. With me, if I don't have a hang-up, I'm not content. Just wish it wasn't my eye. Tulia lost 80% vision in his photographic eye and was unable to take any photographs. He was also experiencing a great deal of pain during his recuperation. The drugs he was administered were strong and addictive, resulting in a depression that would only deepen as the months progressed. Unfortunately, we weren't sufficiently knowledgeable about um, how one reacts to depression or maybe taking tranquilizers or drugs or whatever. We didn't know. I went to the doctor, very wired, bad electricity. Told him I needed Xanax, my poison. He gave me three months supply. I took three, but they only calmed me a little. He was the sort of person that um, wasn't happy in his own skin. And even though he knew, even though everyone else around him loved him and thought he was fantastic, he didn't think that himself. As far as I could truthfully say, that there were two Harrys. The one, uh, the public persona, the one, the actor, he was always the life and soul of the party, the wit and effortless wit, wit that, you know, words just fell from his lips and he was so funny. And then there was the very dark side, which was um, so, I'd say, wonderfully concealed. I mean, we never even knew. Once or twice he said to me, Dad, let's go down for a drink and a chat. If I only had gone with him, you never know what I could have dug up. 
you know. His attacker was identified and charged with assault from which he absconded. However, the injury proved to be a major turning point in Thulia's life. Limited vision in his photographic eye forced him to technically change the way he took photographs. It was a process that was to move him further away from commercial photography. He could have come to a point where he could have done his own work within a commercial framework. And that's not to say that photography in Ireland at the time was very driven by what I would say would be a lot of commercial work which was less than exciting. You try as much because you feel like that's what people expect of you. Oh look, you're a great photographer, you should be, you, you could do anything, you could make money doing this. And yet it doesn't satisfy you inside. It doesn't answer the need that just continuously calls out to you. I remember someone um, who shall rem remain nameless asking him to photograph in a particular dwelling in Dublin. Harry was an artist, and artists and commercial people don't see the same way. I don't like the advertising world. I think they're, it's full of fake people who are trying to do a fake thing, which is make the public buy something they don't want, need, or like. He was advised by the architect, just charge him a small amount of money, because he's a bit tight, you know. And so Harry said, all right, just charge him the materials. So he took the photographs, and he waited for months and months and months. The money never came through, and eventually he rang him and um, went in to see him, and he was brought into the boardroom. You think it was a, a, a £20,000 contract, but anyway... It was a huge sum of £50. It, pounds, it was a very small amount of money, but anyway... He couldn't tolerate um, the arrogance of the people he would have been working for. Well, now, and how much did I owe you, Harry? And Harry mentioned the paltry sum of fifty pounds, and then your aunt said, "What about the discount?" And Harry looked, huh, "The discount." <laughs> he couldn't believe his ears. <laughs> and your man said, "Well, he says, you know, that's business." And Harry said, "No, no," he says, "That's greed." Maybe Harry just read the big picture better and just didn't want to get involved. He didn't want to play the game. Things are changing now because it's kind of hip to have a black and white photograph on the wall. Um, so, and there's a lot of bad stuff going on that people think is great, but it, uh, it's nothing um, like what Harry has produced. I just think that we're being flooded now with information, biographies and autobiographies and and television programs and art, but it's not not really top notch at all. It's it's all commercial. It's very commercial. You have to come back to your roots always. And and I think you know we we're coming to a, a point now where it's it's just it's too. I don't know. Is that the computer age? Of information? I, don't I don't know. if It's the computer or age. I think it's just um, too many people age. You know, there's too much noise out there. Thulier had started to take photographs again. However, he found the process a difficult and frustrating one. He was also suffering from the prolonged use of prescription drugs. They were adversely affecting his personal life and had become a crutch rather than a required medication. His decision to admit himself into the Rutland, a centre for addiction, would prove to be both a positive yet daunting experience. I don't know how I'm going to stand this place. I came in yesterday and the next six weeks seem unbearable. The regime in the centre was the same for everyone. No matter who you were or what you did, everyone there had the same goal. Don't use. There's light at the end of the tunnel. He said there will be many pearls in my path. Most people can't see them. He said if I work the program, I will see them. I will find peace. As time passed, he began to appreciate the simplicity of the daily tasks and enjoy being focused and in control. I know I will be happy when I get over this. I know I will. I congratulate myself on my new freedom, my sanity, my future, but I don't feel like having a party. After an intense of six weeks, Tulia left the Rutland, knowing that an average of eight out of 10 patients would relapse. For anyone in recovery, this was the most dangerous time, but Tulia was determined to maintain his discipline. However, a few weeks later, his long-term girlfriend ended their relationship. Got back into heroin for about three months. It killed the pain of losing her. Somehow I kept crying when I was straight. I cried over my mistakes, over my lost love. I stopped one day last October and decided to make my life better. Sore with someone else and decided not to look back. I got work, 
gone into the College of Surgeons to take pictures, and they've turned out to be the best pictures of my life. He was staying in Letterkenny with some friends, and apparently he was feeling very fragile, very vulnerable, and didn't quite know which way to turn. And um, he came out to the house. I asked him to sit quietly and see if the fairies would say anything, because sometimes they'll come and talk about people, and sometimes they won't. And um, they told me um, that there was a lot of music around him and that the, there had been anguish in his life, um, which had taken him almost to suicide. And when I um, said that to him, he um, showed me his wrists and he uh, began to cry. We talked for a couple of hours and he became a lot calmer and um, he said that he felt a lot better and um, he then began to come and visit quite regularly. Now it's Wednesday. I've done my yoga each day, my Aikido yesterday, vitamins and early nights. I have to get my confidence back, my strength, my dreams. And I really admired him, he was so strong. He didn't take a drink ever. And there were these bacchanalian nights in my place with everybody sw swigging whatever was <laughs> available. And he would sit and sip his water and not um, indulge at all. And yet he still had this sense of fun. Harry used to sort of arrive in, sort of, you know, just out of the blue, and then he'd just arrive and say, ah, Monsieur Caviston, ça va, how are you, you know? And I'd sort of be wave him in and bring him down to the corner and ask him what he'd like for his day's sort of fair, you know, and he'd select some nice things. And He'd always spend countless hours working on these wonderful uh, birthday cards called, but they were birthday, birthday booklets, really. And we've got countless numbers of these books that we just go into the hysterics. Well, they were just, they were terribly funny. It would be my head on a beautiful body and Pamela Anderson holding up her bosoms. Mr. Kevin, don't have a problem. Uh, uh, I have no loot today. May I further forward it on to you? I said, no problem, Harry, you know. And so we selected some nice things, some nice olives and bits and pieces of that. And then he saw the oysters and he said, wow, some oysters. So there and then in the shop, he actually opened an oyster for himself and he downed the hatch. And all we were missing, he said, was the glass of the, uh, the vintage champagne, you know? I remember one night, I'm a terrible a closet case. I have a closet full of dress-up clothes. And um, one night I decided everybody had to get dressed up. And I dressed Harry up as Lawrence of Arabia. And I've never seen anyone take to that costume as well. It was like a duck taking to water. He strode about the place with his robes on and these wonderful knee-high leather boots. He looked quite fetching. I don't think there was a, a female in the place that didn't want to say, oh, me first, me first. <laughs> There's going to be any rape and pillage. Me first, me first. To me, Harry was more than a photographer. He was an artist. And I remember him telling me once about the alternative process of platinum palladium. And it seemed like such a painstakingly difficult way of producing an image. And I remember after the eye injury, where he lost 80% vision in his photographic eye, he needed to see his subject with both eyes. And large format cameras gave him the opportunity to do this. I like to work with Blade and Platinum Beef. And I like to work with a big camera, 8x10. Is there a name for that? Um, it's, it's called Platinum Palladium. Platinum is it's, it's the, old, um, the old process. But in that, by using that way and that, that old, the old, the old-fashioned way, it brings me back there. I mean, it, bring, it, it slows you down, it makes you, it grounds you a bit. It's not uh, digital imagery or anything like that. It's, it's not fast, mm, speedy Gonzales. It, it, this, this is really slow. It's still life. You know? he, he, he told me that if he's interested in doing the alternative processes, platinum, palladium printing. You have a system where you have a light source a piece of glass, your negative, and the coated paper underneath, and you expose that for a period of time, and then you develop it in a series of chemicals. Except you have to make, you have to coat that paper yourself, you have to make the chemical you coat it with, and you make all these chemicals yourself. 
You can't just brush it on. It has to be pulled on in this most perfect mechanical layer. Partly it's a matter of permanence and partly it's a question of the handcrafted nature of the process. The fact that you're not using a commercial photographic material but you're making the paper sensitised yourself. You have more control over the appearance of the image. The platinum process was introduced by William Willis in the 1870s. Whatever commercial life the process had was cut short 30 to 40 years later because of the advent of World War I. The price of platinum increased dramatically due to the unique chemical qualities of the metal. It was a chemical catalyst which brought about chemical reactions without itself changing. That all sounds very innocent, but in fact it's essential for explosives manufacture. And in the First World War, platinum photography, the platinotype, was banned because they wanted the platinum to make bombs. And after the 1930s, anybody who wanted to do platinum prints had to coat their own paper themselves. And that's what Harry came here to learn how to do. A good Im image will look absolutely sublimely beautiful on that kind of printing. But I think the emotional content of what you're doing has to warrant the platinum palladium printing. And uh, that's an important part of Harry's pictures, that sensuality of the skin and and the surface and or the way things feel and the way light hit it. So then you would take this out, you would take your, it's like um, a piece of sponge that's quite stiff, then you put your paper on top, then you place your negative, then you place the glass and the whole thing clips in and then it goes under a light which you then expose. You then take it out and then you put it through the various dishes. All of these chemicals you've made yourself. Now, I think Harry's mind could do all that. Ching, 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 ching. And also he had the patience to do it. Me, I couldn't do it. There was a story I read once about platinum printers and they said there's only two types. One is the rich commercial photographer who at the end of his life can afford to have everything printed in platinum and the other is the hopelessly insane. I think Harry probably fell into that one. The whole discipline in the darkroom is is uh, is enlarged as, as well. You have to be you have to have, to have a touch of madness to uh, to go <laughs> to go through with it all. I know because I've been doing it for twenty five years. <laughs> and I'm totally mad. <laughs> by now, Thulia was using the larger format, ten by eight camera, allowing him to frame his shot using both eyes. In addition, the platinum palladium process perfectly suited both the large format and Thulia's style of photography. With each drop of platinum costing around £20, Thulia set about reprinting his original works. Each finished photograph cost close to £300, so Thulia had to be exact in his preparation. Because of the precise nature of the process, detailed notes had to be written for each image. These clearly show not only the high degree of skill involved, but also the incredible uniqueness of each finished print. And do you think that you can you can stay here as a photographer? Um, I don't I don't think so. You, know, you need to be pushed. You need to be inspired. You need to put around. You need that, that um, rejuvenation. Here there isn't. No, I'm not trying to put this down or anything. I think you need to go away to be inspired and then come back here and then keep keep that momentum going. Um, I think that you have to go away to, to improve yourself. Okay. It's like a good singer, you know, you need to be around Pavarotti's, you need to be around these people. If you're surrounded by the, the, the local choir all the time, you never go anywhere. I do think the later work is more powerful and he seems to have had more, more focus in a way and in a sense a bit more discipline or something to it. He seemed to set himself projects or targets or something and really push back some sort of boundaries of, of, of wanting to see things and of wanting to see more and yet also allowing a certain kind of mystery uh, in the pictures. I'm thinking particularly of the, the, uh, the Skull series which are really just breathtakingly beautiful pictures. Birds, beasts and angels are my landscapes, a portion of my dreams that extend into my waking hours. I see them at street corners, flying in the sky. My friend says I have the yin-yang eye, the next few years would see his appeal widen thanks to exhibitions in Dublin and then Japan. In Japan, it was fine, it was good. It was part of the, um, the, the photography festival. Unfortunately, 
he didn't um, exhibit the things that were really deep to me, like my feet and my skulls, and he chose mostly nudes. No still lives. Well, I was very really disappointed, no still lives. Why, why do you think he chose them? Because he knew they'd sell. But the funny thing was that one time I was there in the gallery and, and this guy came in and he was about to leave and his wife came out and she said, oh, please, please, come back, come back. And she opened up the box of all my pictures and she took out uh, what was a hand holding opium poppies and he loved it. So, you know, so there are some wacky people out there who like, <laughs> like different things. The exhibition itself was great, it was really um, happy because we went to a different world, you know, different culture, different philosophy. And even there, people were amazed by these pictures. You know, for them to see a naked woman uh, was a bit, uh, you know, weird because women over there are not used to, to do this kind of pictures. And he was really proud of himself over there. Because I see, even in Japan, they can understand, you know, my art, my photography. The more he traveled, however, the broader his vision became, particularly his time in Vietnam. He began to concentrate on people and landscapes, on life that had a future rather than life that only had a past. His vision was constantly changing and he demanded new visions. And it seemed that they were his right, and which they are, you know. <clears throat> I took color pictures in Vietnam. I'm not really into colour that much. Yeah. I can appreciate it, but I can't do it very well. Black and white is my um, is my cartoon. Yeah. Because okay. I've you know, been trained that way, so I see things in black and white. Dream in black and white. So when I see you, I see you in black and white. I see this black here. I don't see this colour. I don't see this colour. Sure. I know this is blue. I know this is yellow here. I know your eyes are beautiful green, brown. But no, I'm watching in black and white, and I see that light and shadow. Look, that's it. That's the way I see it. Every morning we were getting up at five and he was going and taking pictures around to the market. He took gorgeous pictures at the market, the fish market. They were great colours and he could see gorgeous people over there. He said it was people he really was looking for. I took pictures at the market on the third. I've never felt so at ease taking photographs before. Everyone was so involved in the buying of fish. Fishermen, women, shrimp, tuna, shark. The man in the barber shop, we were on a bus and he stopped the bus and said, yeah, let me, drop me here, drop me here because I have to go and take pictures. And there was a gorgeous light there because this barber shop, they are all open air and there were like lots of them, one after the other. And he saw this man, he really liked this man because he was like, uh, he was a serious person and he was still there. And to him, this barbershop was like an artist, you know, it was taking like an hour to shave this man. And he was really attracted from the light and the man, exactly that man, because there were lots of people, but I liked that one. And when he asked if he could take pictures, he said, yeah, of course you can. And he paused for Harry, like, uh, I don't know, 40 minutes or something. He wouldn't move and instead uh, taking lots of pictures of this man. Because he said that there was something that meant I really liked and you want to catch the, the, the inside, the inner you know, side of, of this person. I only do them for me, okay? That, that's the truth. When I make a picture, I'm doing it for I want to make a picture. I'm not doing it for anybody else. But ultimately, people will think, when you show them, when you put something on a wall, they're going to look at a skull or a foot or a, or a, or a nude. It's totally my pleasure. You seem to fit in anywhere and yet nowhere. And that is really, you know, that is the artist's lot. But I am me. I always will be. I came to the party wearing the wrong clothes. Photography is the bottom of the pile here, for sure. Nobody would pay what they pay in the States for a print. People don't appreciate what, what a good photograph is. Like a platinum print is, is a wonderful thing when it's when it's executed correctly and it's and it's exhibited beautifully and the subject matter is wonderful. Here, ask for 150. They say, why would we pay 150 pounds for that? I think that people are more educated better over in the States. Uh, well, photographically, I'm not saying that the people in Ireland aren't educated culturally, but they are. I mean, of course, we are unique in that way, but but when it comes to photography, there's a different attitude. Uh, Thulia strongly believed that travel, like his dreams, would fuel his vision. Hearing of a forthcoming solar eclipse in South America, 
he travelled to Peru. The series of photographs he took, though, were lost when his camera bag was stolen. But it was Thulia's subsequent decision to stay that would prove to be of more consequence than he thought. Well, we, we met in South America uh, on a bus travelling from Oyuni to La Paz in uh, Bolivia. That's when we first talked to each other, actually. We had met before just going around places, but then we, we first... We start talking on a bus and we were in La Paz and I went with Harry to markets to buy a bag. And then we were just walking to the market and uh, I held his hand and I kissed him. And he said from there it was fire. Eventually Tiziana had to return to Italy and Tullia to Ireland. Shortly after complaining of a sore throat, Tullia was prescribed antibiotics by his doctor to which he suffered a rare and near fatal reaction. They found he was in acute renal failure, the urea of 53, which is indicative of about 85, 95% of kidney non-function. So he underwent a renal biopsy about a day or two later. But that actually showed that he was allergic to something. And the most likely substance was the antibiotic he'd been put on, a thing called clarithromycin. The brand name is Classet. After about four or five dialysis sessions, his kidney function improved to about 20% or 30% off normal. And that's enough to keep you going. So we stopped the dialysis and took out the line and waited for the body to heal itself. 1997 was to see Tullier exhibit his Vietnam works in Dublin's Apollo Gallery. It was to be his last. For Tullier, Vietnam did not represent an evolution in his work, but rather a continuance of it. What gives his work its truth and beauty is its reflection of his life and thoughts. In retrospect, Thulia achieved in his photographs that which he had been seeking in his life. For stories, I don't find them morbid. You know, okay, I don't. I find them very still and very um, at peace. And that's, that's what I've, I'm, I think that's what I'm looking for myself, is, is, this, is a peace in my life. It seems ironic that the peace he achieved in his photographs would be denied him in his personal life. With Tiziana in Italy and Thulia's work gaining recognition, time and distance would eventually take their toll. Today she said I could stay only two weeks. A far cry from how long will you stay? I feel suspicious and jealous and confused. I wish it didn't mean so much to me. I'm all over the place these days, drinking and smoking without any solution. The prints are going well. Made a print of Titsy that will go down in history. But my heart is fucked up. Well, it wasn't my fault, that's for sure. It wasn't his fault. I was unfaithful to him. That was in summer or something. And I told him. Lots of people thought, well, you should have told me. Well, I reckon it was fair. I had to tell him the truth. I was unfaithful to him. But that relation then was over, and I went down to Madagascar with two girlfriends of mine. But I never believed me, said I went with this man, but I swear God I didn't. And uh, he called me, uh, crying. He was very upset. I, at that stage, lived very close to him. And I walked around to his house, and uh, he was on the bed, and he was very high. And um, I lay on the bed with him. And we hugged and I held him for, for three hours. And we laughed and we cried. And um, it was a very tender moment. It was a very tender moment. And I knew that there was nothing I could say or nothing that he could hear me saying that would really change the course. But it was a great sense of somebody who was very sad, deeply hurt, and was slipping away from me. And I didn't hear from him for a long time and um, then suddenly one night I got a message from the fairies about him um, to tell me to get in touch with him and tell him not to go to Italy and um, the, because if he did there would be something very bad very ultimate that would happen to him and a couple of hours later um, Harry did ring me and I said to him, 
you know, what are your plans? It was obvious that he was in a bad way from the tone of his voice. And um, I said to him, what are your plans? And he said that he was going to go to Italy. And I said, I want you to promise me. This was just before Christmas. I said to him, to him promise me that you won't go to Italy because I have a very bad feeling about that. On the 24th of December, Tullio went to Italy and spent Christmas with the family of his former girlfriend, Fulvia Greco. On the morning of the 27th, she left him at Milan train station to wait for a train to Austria to meet his agent. Harry and his blonde girl, who is a prostitute, took uh, uh, some pills together, something to to let the time uh, pass. Um, Harry was, uh, as I say, not completely controlling his senses anymore. Maybe the pills were too strong. Uh, what you guys say that he didn't want really to have strong pills or strong drugs. He just wanted. He was bored. It wasn't just. Uh, let the time pass and waiting to take these pills, but the pills maybe were too strong. So it was kind of unconscious. And uh, at that time, the girl said, okay, let's have uh, also a heroin. Uh, last thing he said, Harry said this, no, I don't want that shit. I don't want. But it, at the same time, it was really uh, unconscious. And uh, so the girl called a man from Maroc um, and said, OK, we want 10 lines of heroin. She took the money from the Harry's pocket and paid the heroin. And uh, the man uh, the, from Maroc uh, put the heroin in uh, Harry's arm. Um, but, uh, and Harry collapsed. So the man from Mara say, uh, this man is not used to have it. He has, doesn't have any sign on his arm. And he's collapsing, he's dying. Let's talk, uh, let's call ambulance, let's call doctors. And this woman, I, I don't know why, say no, he's happy now, let him sleep, let him relax. Uh, it's really relaxing now, let him stay. They didn't call the ambulance. When someone has called, it was too late. And then I remembered my dream, my dream about Harry. And that had that occurred, oh goodness me, many, many months beforehand. And I was thinking, dreaming, and I woke up and I said, oh my God, it can't be true. It was an obituary notice. Harry Thulier Jr. R.I.P. I'll never ever forget it. And, and I tried to put that out of my mind. And, but coming up to Christmas time, I was so blue and so down. But we seemed to walk down somewhere down the corridor into my bedroom and we sat on the end of the bed and we talked and I, for the life of me, I can't remember what we spoke about, but we sat there and we were holding hands because I was really terribly close to Harry. I mean, I just, I loved him, loved him so, so very much. And we were holding hands and I said, Harry, you're going to die before Daddy. And he just looked at me and he said, he smiled, and we left it at that. That was the end. Two weeks later, Harry was gone. The autopsy report showed only one very recent needle mark on his arm. Along with eyewitness accounts of his reluctance to be injected, the Italian police ruled out an accidental overdose, as Thulia was obviously not a user. Several people were held for questioning. However, they could only be detained for a maximum of 12 hours. They would have to be released without charge. Eventually, the investigation into the death of Harry Tullier Jr. was closed.
pictures were never made just to be pictures. There was something he wanted to. He had something to say with these images. I suppose it's a job for people like ourselves here in the gallery is to to educate the public that that photographs can be rare and um, and nowhere is that more eloquently played out than in the case of Harry where you know if someone dies well then that really is the end of it isn't it but maybe he brought vision and freedom too far too quickly uh, he just flashed across the sky didn't he living is beautiful living is fine I don't care about having no money or having no home or having nothing that matters I'm not having no film I can find I can find anything you can, you can find your happiness your peace but it's the end of the movie that really bugs me <laughs> really and truly you know you go through all these lives and you think he lived from 1860 to 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18